This morning I'm going to talk to you about veterinary care of germ-free mice and rats. And uh, the specific objectives of uh, my presentation are to provide you with um, basic anatomy, physiology, um, biology, disease of uh, germ-free rodents, specifically mice and rats, um, discuss species difference where applicable and their importance in veterinary care. Um, provide you with an overview of germ-free versus conventional rodents and um, their use in biomed biomedical research. Um, discuss regu uh, relevant regulatory guidelines for care and use of germ-free animals. Um, how many um, people within the audience are veterinarians or work within the lab animal industry by show of hands? So um, you know well our um, challenges forthcoming with the implementation of the new guide for uh, the care and use of uh, laboratory animals. So I wanted to kind of go into detail what the impact of the new guide will be um, on rearing germ-free animals moving forward. Um, discuss nutritional requirements and metabolism of germ-free rodents and provide guidance on overcoming challenges um, regarding specific method methodologies related to germ-free animals. So um, I wanted to start off just by reviewing some basic definitions. Um, so for germ-free specifically, we're talking about animals that are free of all foreign uh, life forms um, apart from themselves versus a conventional animal which harbors normal indigenous but um, undefined microflora and notobiotic. So um, definition here for us for notobiotic is any animal or system in which all life forms are known. At Taconic, within our notobiotic facility, we house two types of animals in our isolators, uh, mostly flexible foam, or mostly, or all of our animals um, within our notobiotic facility are housed in a flexible foam isolator, and we main the, maintain these animals at two health status. One, uh, germ-free, and the other is defined flora. So the defined flora animal is actually an animal in which we allow fungal molds in the isolator, we allow yeast, um, and these are animals which are actually um, associated. And when we say associated, we are giving these animals um, the altered shadler flora and rearing them in um, the flexible foam isolator. Taconic is a very unique organization in that all of our foundation colonies are maintained on notobiotic stock. And what this allows us to do is to ensure the health of the animals once they leave the notobiotic facility and go to um, our housing system, which is the uh, isolated barrier unit. So um, it allows us to always start and maintain our colonies and our barriers um, specific pathogen free and free, free of disease. So as far as uses of germ-free animals in biomedical research, um, as you all are aware, the germ-free animals are a major means in which researchers are looking at the relationship between the host and its microflora. And they're used in many branches of, of research, including cardiovascular research, dental research, um, diet and nutrition, um, studying gastrointestinal diseases, infectious diseases, um, and looking at the mechanism of disease, uh, immunological research, and uh, neurological research. Um, I could say that probably based on um, the needs for Taconic that um, most of the animals right now are being used primarily for um, immunological research uh, and immunological studies. Specifically, um, and if you do, uh, like if you look through peer review literature, you're going to see a lot of use of um, germ-free animals looking at inflammatory bowel disease, impact of interleukins um, and mechanism of disease related to like Crohn's to di Crohn disease or in inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, in our case, the germ-free animals, again, provide a nucleus for specific pathogen-free colonies um, within um, our facilities. So some key characteristics between conventional and germ-free animals. Um, the microflora within a healthy conventional 
um, animal is very large, as you can see. So um, in one of the references that Sue Ellen indicated to uh, germ-free animal and biomedical research, they, equi they equate the weight of the conventional bacteria in a human to be equivalent to a thousand um, grams. Um, one of the unique characteristics in conventional animals is that 95% 95, 95 of the total number of the intestinal bacteria are um, obligate anaerobes. So in our experience, what we notice is that the primary anaerobe of the germ-free animal is um, bacterioides. So that's mostly a primary agent, which is, is, is cultured. Um, the other unique thing about conventional animals is that they have a stratified organization of, of the gut flora. So a prim primary amount of the organisms in the conven conventional animals are located within the crypts um, of lubricon within the uh, intestine. The germ-free animal, on the contrary, um, adapts anatomically and physiologically to the environment um, in which it's devoid of microflora. Um, they do have greater nutritional requirements than the conventional animals due to the lack of, of microflora. I was going to use the joke saying that um, I'm not an expert in germ-free animals, but um, I make very few trips to the home of the of, uh, the germ-free animals, which makes them think that I am the expert. But it's really they don't have any flora, so they don't get sick all the time. So um, it 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 does have some advantages as far as um, the clinical aspects of disease and rearing these animals. Germ-free um, rodents do grow and breed similar to rodents raised in uh, conventional settings. Um, however, as we go forward and talk about anatomical differences between the germ-free and conventional animal, you will see that there are some unique anatomical differences that make reproduction um, difficult. Germ-free rodents are published to have a longer lifespan when fed an ad libitum diet to com compare to uh, conventional animals. So when developing a germ-free rodent, um, typically they're developed either by two mechanisms, one cesarean uh, derivation or by embryo transfer. So under cesarean derivation, um, it's important to note from a disease mechanism that hysterectomy does not always eliminate pathogens that can contaminate the fetus after uterine implantation. So there are specific diseases that can be vertically um, transmitted and can pre present um, an issue as far as uh, germ-free development. And some of those diseases are listed here on that slide, LCMV, um, LDH, uh, Pastorella pneumotropica pneumotropica and mycoplasma. Versus with embryo transfer, um, typically the animals under germ-free are developed at the two-cell stage, um, and the embryo transfer allows us to eliminate issues associated with um, vertical transmission or cesarean derivation. Important anatomical differences between the germ-free mouse and uh, conventional mouse, and same would apply to rats, is that the germ-free animal has a very enlarged cecum. And the cecum uh, is here in this slide. And what you'll notice compared to the conventional animal is that the cecum is about five times the normal size. Um, and due to this, the reproductive performance um, may be limited because the, of the restricted abdominal space. Um, another important um, thing to note about germ-free animals is that um, they produce more urea. Um, there's little ammonia in the intestinal contents because there's no microflora to break, to break it down. And we'll talk about the importance of that when it comes to environmental monitoring and the guide. Um, as far as the physiology of the germ-free um, animal, the germ-free animals do have um, intestinal atonia. Um, so they have altered myenteric neurons, and this results in the reduction of the smooth muscle tone. 
So if you were going to use these animals where you wanted to look at intestinal transit time, note that the intestinal transit time in these animals would be lower than you would see typically in a conventional animal. Due to the large enlarged cecum, the primary clinical finding that you may see within a germ-free animal is cecal volvulus, which is torsion of the cecum upon itself. Um, this will result in strangulation and is a emergency situation that will lead to death in these animals. Um, germ-free animals produce semi-solid stools. So they typically, if you were going to we had talked about fecal collection. They uh, appear to have what we would call a chronic diarrheal state um, due to a large amount of mucin located in their feces. Germ-free animals do not have urobilin in their urine, um, and they do have high urinary calcium and citrate and low phosphate. So if you have investigators who want to do um, your analysis, these are important things that you should note in rearing germ-free uh, animals. So this is a, uh, a histology section of, of the normal gut of a conventional animal. So you can see this lower part of the slide is the submucosa. The upper part of the side represents the lamina propria or the intestinal crypts um, of the germ-free, of, of, of the animal. What I'd like to, oh, I'm sorry. What I'd like to note is that um, the germ-free animals um, have a thinning of the wall of the small intestine. So their lamina propria, if you were to look at it on a histological section, will be a lot thinner, probably half the size of, of what is depicted here in this particular slide. Um, within that lamina propria, in comparison to conventional animals, there are sparse numbers of uh, of plasma cells. So the germ-free animals will have a decreased amount of um, Ig immunoglobulin A. So um, again, working with your research staff, these are important immunological aspects of the germ-free mouse that you should be aware of compared to the conventional animal. They have a decreased mucosal surface and reduced renewal rates of the intestinal uh, epithelium. From an immunology perspective also, we like to note that um, as far as the lymph node morphology of the germ-free animal, uh, germ-free animals contain um, one twelfth of the blast and antibody producing cells than um, conventional animals. Um, this lower number of anti antibody producing cells is not an indicator, indicator of uh, reduced immune function. Their immune function is normal, um, and their immune response is equal to that, and in many cases greater than that of um, conventional mice. These animals do have reduced uh, circulating um, leukocytes and lower serum levels of immunoglobulin due to, the, uh, due to decreased antigenic stimulation. No microflora, no stimulation. Um, for investigators who are interested in doing transplant re research, um, they do have good graft versus host uh, reaction. Um, from a cardiovascular standpoint, for those investigators who may want to do specific studies related to cardiovascular, area, cardiovascular or pulmonary research, um, important things to note is that the heart, lungs, liver of germ-free mice are much smaller than conventional mice. Um, their cardiac output is um, typically one-third uh, less that of a conventional mouse. They have reduced blood volume and flow to organs. So, you know, for those investigators who are looking at blood flow, you know, you get a call and say, oh, their blood flow is significantly less, um, you know, why. Uh, reduced, they have reduced vascular response to catecholamines, um, increased red blood counts, um, and hematocrit. And then as far as the alveolar cells and the capsular cells within the lung, they are um, thinner in comparison to the conventional animal. Additional anatomical and physiological aspects. Um, the germ-free animal um, has decreased body fat percentage. 
they have a decreased metabolic rate. And this will be very important when we talk about challenges um, in the germ-free animal, especially when it comes to anesthesia protocols. Um, that decreased basal metal metabolic rate will be um, important. Um, voluntary intake of food is normal or increased. Um, they have increased water intake, altered endocrine function, so they have decreased iodine uptake in, the, in their thyroid glands and decreased motor, motor activity in comparison to the conventional animal. Um, they also have increased exocrine pancreatic function and um, as far as reproduction, their diastrous period may be prolonged um, and this may result in a reduced frequency of estrus and um, reduced copulation and implantation uh, rates. And this is strain, this may be strain dependent. A difference from the germ-free mouse and the rat, um, important to note is that the germ-free rat does have um, soft tissue calcification. So the rats have a greater uh, absorption and retention of um, calcium and magnesium, resulting in soft tissue calcification. Um, and they also have increased intestinal bile acids. Um, an important uh, thing to note about the germ-free rat as far as their, um, um, when they're fed on a high cholesterol diet, uh, the germ-free rat does develop two times the levels of blood cholesterol compared to um, the conventional rat. And this is seen um, more so in females than in males. So we do get a lot of um, requests to feed um, germ-free animals high-fat diet, um, which, as Dr. Roche had alluded to, comes with challenges because all of the high-fat di high diets are uh, irradiated. So um, we like to tell our customers that it's very difficult to maintain the germ-free status on an irradiated uh, high-fat diet, and um, we can't many times uh, because the vendors can't guarantee sterility. And as Paula had alluded to earlier, you know, you can have, uh, a, you can do lot testing and one bag of feed will pass, whereas another bag within the same lot does not pass. So um, it's difficult to guarantee the germ-free status um, when we pass this high-fat diet into the isolators. So as far as um, veterinary care of the germ-free animal, one of the important things to note is that um, due to the elimination of the gastrointestinal microflora, um, these animals have an increased host susceptibility to infectious diseases. As soon as you remove a germ-free um, mouse that has not been associated into a conventional setting, um, death will occur uh, within days from dysbiosis. Um, from a research standpoint, for investigators who are looking to, um, to look at mechanisms of disease, please note that germ-free animals do have increased susceptibility to specific bacterial diseases. Most notably, um, you will see um, more severe infections in germ-free animals for animals, uh, those animals exposed to Shigella, um, anthrax, listeria, influenza, or Coxsackie B. Um, germ-free animals um, uniquely have altered and various res varied responses to parasitic infections. Um, it's n they're not consistent in the rate in which um, they acquire these infections. They are resistant to some parasitic infections versus um, others. And the viral infection results um, in comparable or slightly higher interferon production. So um, they may have elevated responses to viral infection compared to those of um, a conventional animal. So again, I think you've seen this a lot in several slides. So as far as the transport of the germ-free animal, um, our main stay of transporting um, germ-free animals is through our germ-free shipper. And um, we'll go into more detail uh, within the workshop 
on how these are hooked up to the isolator, how animals are passed in, and we look forward and welcome your comments related to the construction and design of this and ways to improve it moving forward. So regarding husbandry um, of the germ-free animal, um, it's important that the diet is fortified with uh, vitamins. We had talked today a lot about mechanisms of sterilizing feed. So autoclaving um, will affect the nutritional content of the feed as well as gam gamma radiation. Um, in our experience, um, in working with the vendors for gamma uh, irradiation of feed, the recommend, I know we had talked about um, 40 um, kilograms being an effective dose to, um, to sterilize the feed via gamma irradiation, um, but we have found in working with our vendors that uh, a dose of 40 may destroy some of the nutritional content of the feed. And so the, recommend, the recommended dose for um, sterilizing feed that does not affect the nutritional content is 25 um, kilograms. But again, remember at 25, we do experience this challenge, challenges in guaranteeing um, sterility. So autoclave, autoclavable diets, there really isn't much issues in, in, in uh, worrying about vitamin or nutritional con content because these diets are fortified with additional vitamins. So um, just to highlight again, in our experience, most of the contaminants from feed um, we find are from aerobic spore-forming rods or as Paula had alluded to, um, bacillus organisms. Um, as far as husbandry is concerned, um, important environmental cons considerations are temperature and humidity controls. So it's really important to note that the temperature uh, within the isolator uh, is usually higher and the humidity lower than in the actual room housing uh, the isolator. Um, an important consideration, especially when we talk about um, the guide and increase requirements for uh, environmental monitoring, um, ventilation will be um, very important. So as you talk about loading your isolator, Frank had talked about capacity of the isolator, you want to make sure that um, there's adequate airflow and ventilation through the uh, isolator such that it uniformly ventilates every cage. And one of the uh, most useful indicators for a flexible film isolator where you have poor air quality is you get condensation buildup um, within the inside of the isolator. Um, also note um, too, and I'm kind of getting into some of the guide, guide um, highlights, is that within um, the guide there's also references to environmental monitoring now about um, monitoring vibration, uh, uh, within the animal housing rooms, ensuring there are minimal levels of vibration because vibration can um, induce stress, which can alter the phenotype of the animals housed in, in the isolator. Um, and also making notes um, of looking at pressure differentials um, to avoid adverse uh, effects on the health. So um, the isolators uh, are positive pressure Isolators, um, one of our, and Jamie probably can allude to that uh, and provide um, greater detail of some of the things that we do to ensure that we're maintaining um, the pressure differentials within the isolator. So there's the magna helix where you can actually look at the pressure differential across the isolator, but there's just some key indicators. Is it inflated? Is it not? Or is it deflating? So um, one of the things that um, you will note is that, um, especially in ger uh, generating germ-free animals, um, it's an expensive project uh, uh, to, to perform. And so um, losing your iso isolator due to pressure differentials could be um, catastrophic. And as, as a result of that, we um, at Taconic implement mul multiple redundancies. So, you know, if the blower goes out, it's hooked up to a generator, and then there's, there's a, we have backup to a backup to a backup to ensure that the isolators are maintained effectively. 
Uh, and then we also um, monitor water quality. And Paula had talked a lot about microbial um, sampling of the isolator and what's included in, in that. The new expanded recommendations under the guide. So um, for those who, are, who of you who are not familiar, um, with the guide coming out, there is a lot of increased requirements for um, looking at uh, performance standards. So um, the requirements for cage size for rodents has, has changed. So there's requirements for increased cage size. So when you're talking about planting capacity, the capacity that you may have had previously for um, loading an isolator may be significantly reduced. So in planning, um, moving forward, uh, it's really important to uh, take into consideration the guide changes related to, um, to cage size. So for example, um, there are new requirements as far as um, female, there's a new section in the guide related to females with litters and that for mice um, you now have to provide, uh, a female mouse with a litter you have to provide 51 square inches of space and rats you have to provide uh, 124 square inches of space. So this is significantly going to alter your capacity, um, the isolator when you're breeding. Um, also, in the new guide, um, there's uh, references to enrichment. So um, typically within Taconic, we use nesting materials. Some people use um, like shepherd shacks uh, for enrichment. Um, and the new guide states that uh, enrichment devices are not considered part of the floor space moving forward. So, you know, you're going to have increased the take home message of this, there's going to be increased requirements for, for size and space. Um, as far as uh, the performance standards, um, any guide exceptions, you're going to have to have supportive data to um, qualify those performance standards. And now the new guide also um, has increased um, information related to uh, post approval monitoring. So um, moving forward, your institutional animal care and use committee is going to be are going to have to be heavily engaged in assessing performance standards. Um, at one particular point, um, you could use ammonia as an indicator of, um, of uh, a frequency of cage changes, but in a germ-free environment, remember, the ammonia production is low, so that's not a useful um, indicator you know, for, for guide exceptions. But uh, you're going to have to uh, provide um, additional uh, performance standards um, to justify guide exceptions. So those could be um, in some of the things with the, the Lab Animal Breeders Association. We're looking at things that I'm um, looking at uh, performance efficiency indices. Um, looking at animal welfare parameters. The response was that many people are not using anesthesia in the germ and germ-free animal and germ-free animals. Um, uh, at Taconic, we do use Avertin, which is a non-pharmaceutical grade um, chemical. So, there's it's really important to justify the use um, of non-pharmaceutical grade uh, materials, and we do use it with success without some of the reported effects of um, peritonitis, um, um, adynamic ileus that you would see um, with the use of this particular anesthetic uh, agent. I think that we will continue to use it um, with providing justification, and, I, and I, we use it at a frequency enough to show, the, to show actual data that we do not um, experience the problems. Um, our embryologists um, in development of germ-free animals and looking at embryo transfer, there in the development of the animals there are significant effects of different anesthetics on um, live birth rates and uh, agents such as like ketamine xylazine will decrease live, live form rates. So um, from a 3R perspective, there are benefits of using this particular anesthetic versus versus others. But another thing in the in the guide uh, in the 
the new guy coming out in the 22, 2010, there are references about uh, HVAC controls and monitoring heat, heat load. So I think we had some discussions about, um, what's your name? Gus. Yeah, so Gus had talked about experimental isolators and passing special equipment within the isolator. So, you know, if that's electrical equipment, are you taking into consideration the heat load of the equipment in that particular isolate, isolator in addition to the heat load of the animals in the cage? So is the temperature in the isolator elevated as a result of um, this increased equipment into the isolator? Those are some things that you might want to consider moving forward with the implementation of the new guide. So as far as germ-free methodologies, I think one of our biggest, um, some of our biggest challenges um, are related to animal transportation um, and the type of, of containers we use. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but the, the, the issue here is to maintain germ-free status. We find most success with a germ-free um, shipper versus the, the taconic transit cage. So all of our animals, to maintain germ-free status, we use the germ-free uh, shipper um, in uh, shipping the animals to, to our customers. Um, as far as sterilization, um, we prefer, again, uh, steam sterilization, autoclaving versus ionizing uh, radiation. Um, there are challenges as far as ster sterilizing um, supplies um, and particularly, particularly liquids. And one of the things that I wanted to, um, to emphasize as far as methodologies for our customers, we often uh, rear transgenic animals, and as far as ensuring genetic quality of the animals that we produce, um, it often requires us to do tail biopsies of the animals within the, within the isolator. This does not um, typically present a problem for weanling animals, but once an animal is, has, has been weaned, if we need to go back and do an additional uh, additional genetic monitoring in the, on the older animals, anesthesia is required to minimize um, pain and distress. So you can imagine what the challenge is here in trying to pass um, anesthetics into the isolator and still maintain the germ-free sterility. So for those of you who are familiar with anesthetics, most of them are injectable vials, right? Or if you look at um, the construction of some of the vials that may go into the isolator, anything with a screw cap where bacteria can serve as a nevus, you know, within, um, within the vial can be a potential compromise to your germ-free isolator. Um, some of the ways that we overcome that challenges is by using, um, for tail, biops tail biopsies, we use local anesthetics. Um, but anything that we pass into the isolator, we send to the QC laboratory for sterility testing, to guarantee sterility testing before it's passed into the isolator. So most of the anesthetics we use for tail biopsies are, are topical, a topical lidocaine mixture. And if you, any of you can find a location that guarantees sterility of any anesthetics, please let us know. <laughs> We will welcome to um, welcome to find find vendors that offer that product. But um, in my search and search of other veterinarians within Taconic, we have not been able to find any. There isn't a lot of literature talking about anesthetic responses or alter responses of anesthetics in germ-free animals. Um, but um, through my research, I have noted that um, germ-free animals do have altered responses to uh, pentobarbital. So um, as far as the xenobiotic metabolism of, of the barbiturates in germ-free animals, it's reported that they have a, uh, a lower anesthetic time. So it's a lot the, the time for anesthesia is significantly less um, using in a germ-free animal than in a conventional animal. So um, approximately half of the time. So if you got 40 minutes in conventional, you may only get 20 minutes in a, in a germ-free animal. So the methods 
uh, again, for anesthetic administration, could be through parenteral um, injection. Um, the people within our notobiotic facility cringe when it comes to um, introducing needles and sharp objects into the isolator because they are a major source of a break within the isolator. You know, you puncture a hole, then you lose the whole thing. So um, that's another reason or advantage of using the topical anesthetics uh, within, within the isolator for the uh, genetic monitoring. Um, we do not have published data on this, but um, our group within our veterinary uh, sciences team have looked and explored um, the use of the open drop method for isoflooring within the isolator. We actually have, have sent you know, isoflurane to the lab for um, sterility testing. Um, the big thing here is that it rapidly evaporates. So we got no growth. <laughs> so the growth is because it's not there or because it evaporated before we could culture it. Um, but we have been able to successfully anesthetize animals with isoflurane using the open drop method. But we're very selective in when to use that that procedure, but it is an effective way to um, anesthetize the animals. So that was the end of um, my presentation. I'll talk about, see if anyone has any specific questions, but also I wanted to note that um, these are the references highlighting all the anatomical physio physiological differences um, in the germ-free uh, mouse. Um, I use the same book as Sue Allen for a reference to the germ-free animals, the red book on the table, um, which is an excellent resource in talking about um, the differences between germ-free conventional animals as well.